the Shenley Laboratories, producer of Pencil and Shenley and Shenley Pharmaceuticals, presents the Encore Theater. The Encore Theater play tonight, A Man to Remember. Our star is Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Tonight, Shenley Laboratories presents another in a new series of great dramatic programs. Some of our stories are fact, the struggles and accomplishments of great men of medicine. Others are fiction, stories of devotion to an ideal, individual heroism, or great courage. By these programs, Shenley Laboratories would remind you that medical science and progress are not cold, impersonal research or pages of statistics, but a warm human story told in living terms whether it's the life of one of medicine's immortals or the everyday record of service rendered by your family physician. And now, A Man to Remember, starring Mr. Lionel Barrymore. doctor was dead. The funeral was over. It had been an impressive afternoon. The town band had walked before the funeral coach, and the people of the town had thronged the sidewalks to pay their last respects. The doctor was dead. The earth was in place, and the stone, and the words that honored him. And before the afternoon sun had set, the vultures had gathered in his lawyer's office. George Sykes, the banker, Homer Ramsey, owner of the local department store, Joe Harkness, president of the school board. Sit down, gentlemen. I've brought Dr. Abbott's strong box with me. I find that in most cases of this nature, the creditors prefer to wait until, well, the day after the benediction has been delivered. Now, looky here, Clyde. That ain't fair. The doc would want us to have our money. I hold Doc Abbott's personal note for $600 plus 100 interest. How about you, Homer? I had the bookkeeper figure up his account today. He owes the store $726.37. Hasn't paid a bill since 1928. And you, Jude? He owes me $1,100. His son gave this box to me this morning when I explained how eager you were to get his father's affairs in shape. Gentlemen, here is the estate. The estate? That's right. A black signet ring, a nice tray, and some papers. Suppose we take the papers one by one. This one is headed Westport First National Bank. It reads... Sixty days after date, or on demand, I promise to pay to George Sykes and, or, the Westport First National Bank, the sum of $300 with accumulated interest at 7 per centum. Signed, John Abbott. Dated, June 16, 1919. That's the date, all right. He walked into my office with Dick. Dick was, uh, about eight then. Two of them looked about as poor as church mice. Well, if it ain't John Abbott. Yeah. How are you, Joe? I'm fine, fine. Sit down. How are you? Ah, it's been a long while. Yeah, pretty near 25 years. That's right. You left for college right after we graduated from high school, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you were voted the boy most likely to succeed, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seems kind of funny now, doesn't it? Ah, it sure does. Aiming to stay here for a while? Well, as long as it's useful to the community, George. Well, I don't know. We got some doctors here already. Well, I thought there might be enough room for one more. Well, might be at that. Mm. A lot of poor folks on the other side of town build up quite a little factory section over there. Mm. A lot of them folks need doctoring. Well, I guess I'll stay then. I, I need a little eating money, though. Uh, how much? About $300. That's a whale of a lot of money, John. Well, I aim to do a whale of a lot of eating in this town. Yeah. Uh, what have you got to offer as security? Seventeen years' experience as a practicing physician. Yeah, you know what we say about horses, John. Hmm? There's horses, and then again, there's horses. <laughs> yeah. I always say that about doctors, too. Well, I've done pretty well. You're broke, ain't you? 
I meant about keeping my patients alive. That's my business, you know. All right, John. I'm going to make out a note for $300, and I'll give you 250 Got to have a little bonus, you know, when there isn't any security. Hmm. But I always like to help an old friend. Yeah. Do you help out many of your old friends this way, George? Uh, <clears throat> sign on this line. <laughs> they should have elected you, the boy most likely to succeed. <laughs> It sure was a long time ago. Here's the second paper. It's a bill, one of Dr. Abbott's statements. It's made out to Howard Johnson. It reads, June 17, 1919, delivery of child, $25. Beneath it is the notation, Johnson has no money. Well, Doc, you have a fine baby girl, Johnson. Girl. And a healthy one, too. Girls ain't no good on a farm. I wanted a boy. I wanted somebody who could help me work this land when I get old. Girls are for people who can afford them. How about my wife? Johnson, I, uh, I did everything I could. I I'm afraid she wasn't in very good condition to begin with, and... Well, I, uh, I did everything I could. I know how you feel. I lost my wife that way. She never had nothing while she lived... Bad crops, bad times. I was going to have a good crop this season. I was going to buy her something. Yeah, yeah. Now, now keep the baby warm. And you, we... you get out of here. Get out of here. Don't let me come back. But, man, man, you, you want to know how to take care of the baby. I told so... you to get. Get, I said, Get. <laughs> Well, some shiner, Pop. <laughs> it is a beaut, isn't it? <laughs> What's that? Sounds like a baby crying. It's outside. Come on. It is a baby. Look, in that box. Well, I'll be... Come on, let's get her inside right away. Here's a note. Let me have it, son. Dear Doc, I'm sorry I hit you. Give the kid to somebody who'll be good to it. Johnson. She sure is little, isn't she? Yeah. Well, son, it looks as though you got a baby sister. I'd forgotten Jean wasn't his own child. Now, what's the next paper? This is a bill to Dr. Abbott. It's from you, Homer. See? Homer Ramsey, General Merchandise. June 17th, 1923, to Dr. Abbott account, one baby doll, $12. Please remit. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Jeannie, happy birthday to you. <laughs> now, take a big breath and blow the candles out, honey. Hey, that's wonderful. All four at once. That means you're going to get your wishes. Now then, what did you wish for? A dolly. A dolly. Okay. Well, well, well. I suppose you go and look in your bedroom and see what you find. You go with us, son. Turn the lights on. Yes, sir. Come on, Jean. Hello? Yep. Who? Oh, Homer Ramsey. What's the matter? Oh, I see. Doc Robinson's out of town. All right, I'll be right over. Doctors have the dog on his time trying to give parties. How is she, Doc? Well, Homer, your wife has acute appendicitis. I'm going to have to operate right away. How much are you going to charge me for this operation? I, I understand. Are you by any chance interested in how your wife is doing? Well, I certainly am, Doc. But I don't want any of this funny stuff about the price of the operation. I want a fair price. But I don't want to be stuck, you understand? Uh -huh, I understand. How Are is... you interested by any chance in how your wife's doing? How is she? Well, she's very low. <laughs> Hello, Homer. Hello, Doc. 
Doc. What can I do for you? Uh, I uh, have the bill here with me for your wife's operation. One hundred dollars? That's right, John. That's right, Homer. How much of your time did the operation take? About four hours, I calculate. Pretty good money for four hours' work. Well, here, John. Let's get down to the facts. I don't mind paying a just fee, but a hundred dollars for four hours. That's pretty steep. You really mean that, don't you, Homer? You bet I do. <laughs> uh, what do you pay your janitor around here? Oh, 40 cents an hour. Yeah, you see, I made a mistake in figuring the bill, Homer. Well, that's more like it. Yep, yep. The only place we differ is the value each of us puts on your wife. I was a mite too high. So I'll settle right now for 40 cents an hour. A dollar sixty cash. <laughs> now, John, I didn't mean that. <laughs> Perfectly willing to pay a fair price. Give me a dollar sixty cents. But I... you. Uh... I feel ashamed to settle for that, John. Really, now you know... I... Give me the money. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll just fix the bill. To Homer Ramsey, account appendicitis operation, Mrs. Ramsey, $100. Settled for a dollar sixty cents cash. You got a bargain at that, Homer. You'd have had to pay a grave digger for six hours. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our play, A Man to Remember, to bring you an important message from Shenley Laboratories. Today in the supply room of 8,383 American hospitals, you will find penicillin. Yet only three years ago, the wonder drug was almost a medical rarity. The firms who devoted themselves to increasing the supplies of penicillin available struggled against many obstacles inherent in its production. Numbered among these firms was Shenley Laboratories. Although these companies have seen the realization of their goal, enough penicillin to fill essential needs, they cannot feel their work is done. Up to the present, research workers at Shenley Laboratories have developed such products as penicillin tablets and trochees for administration by mouth, and penicillin ointment and ophthalmic ointment. Now these men are looking forward to the perfecting and production of other and perhaps entirely different types of pharmaceuticals. It is ever the aim of Shenley Laboratories to know more of what benefits to mankind may be derived from medical research. It is our aim, too, to translate the knowledge we gain into production of more and greater aids to healing for all members of the medical profession. And now, back to the second act of tonight's play, A Man to Remember, starring Mr. Lionel Barrymore. doctor was dead, and the afternoon sun was still haloing the freshly turned earth. The doctor was dead, and in his lawyer's office sat his creditors, the banker, the merchant, the president of the school board. What's that next paper there, Lawyer Perkins? Anything of value? Not to you, Jode. It's the announcement of Richard's graduation from Curtis University. We all remember how proud Doc Abbott was that day. Richard was valedictorian of his class. Yes, it was, uh... 1934. Right after graduation, Dick went to the New York Medical Center for postgraduate work. Uh, what's that paper there? The bill? October 8, 1936, to Paul Lubinovsky, deceased. Paul Lubinovsky? You remember Paul Lubinovsky, don't you, Joe? Of course you do. The doc mentioned him when he was arguing with you about building a hospital. As a matter of fact, all of you are there. Homer, George, as well as Joe. It was a Board of Supervisors meeting. Last week, this Board of Supervisors appropriated $18,000 to fight hog cholera. I have always worked on the theory that a man is more valuable than a hog. Now, that ain't fair, Doc, and you know it. Hogs are a big industry around here. Well, so are people. You figure that a dead hog represents $20 loss and a dead man costs nothing. 
Isn't it as much your business to take care of human beings as it is to take care of all? As far as I'm concerned, the whole scheme is ridiculous. Our budget won't stand it. The whole thing's impractical. All right, gentlemen. All right, all right. Sorry I can't spend more time with you, but I got work to do. There's a fellow on the other side of town named Lubinovsky. He's a foreman at the flour mill. They tell me his crew puts out more flour than the outfit in the mill. He's a good man. Mm -hmm. Almost as good as a hog. Yesterday, he got his arm caught in the mill. I had to amputate. I couldn't move him because I had no hospital to move him to. No ambulance if there had been a hospital. Now, I don't think Paul Lubinovsky can pull through. Now, you take care of the hogs. I'll take care of the people. Dad! Dad, where are you? Dr. Abbott, what's happened? What's the matter? It's my arm. It was my fault, sir. I, I was showing her my gun. It was an accident. Come in the other room quickly. Come on. Come on, Howard. I'll need you, too. How does that feel, honey? Fine. You're a good doctor. <laughs> well, at least I'm the best one handy. It's not very serious, Howard. It may leave a small scar, but that's about all. I'm awfully sorry, sir, and I, well, I know there isn't anything to be said for me, but I'll do anything I can to make it right. You mean that, Howard? Oh, I certainly do. Well, I got a little plan in mind. Anything. I'll do anything. Relax, son. Relax. It isn't that drastic. Now, my plan is this. Your father loves you, doesn't he? What? Oh, yes. And you're sorry for what you've done. So sorry that you'll make your father show how much he loves you. Yes, sir. Howard, Jean may have needed surgery tonight. X-rays. Transfusion. And time might have been very important. You wouldn't have been a very happy boy, Howard, if Jean Doctor! Had... I, I didn't know. I, no, no, I didn't no, realize. No, 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 no. This near tragic little accident may be a blessing in disguise, Howard. I want you to go to your father. Tell him a man as big as he is should engrave his name in the history of this town. He should leave something big for the town and for himself. Why... Like what? Like the George Sykes Memorial Hospital. That was a fine gesture you made, George, building that hospital. Well, I probably would have done it anyhow. I must admit it's come in handy. It was rather small of you, though, I think, restricting Dr. Abbott to the charity ward. Well, the charity cases were always his pets anyway. Uh... Let's get on with the box. Uh, this is a bill, a statement sent September 21st, 1937, to Mrs. Walter Lamb, account Sally Lamb, $6. Oh, I remember that. I think we all remember that. Now, keep Sally in the house, Mrs. Lamb, and don't under any circumstances let any children come in. I'll write out exactly what I want you to do. Of course, you'll be quarantined. But uh, I'll be back this afternoon. Do you think it's anything serious, Doctor? Yes, I think it's typhoid fever. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm sorry to have to interrupt a board of the supervisors again, but uh, what I have to say today won't take very much time. You're having a county fair in two weeks... And I've come here to ask you to cancel it. Cancel it? Are you crazy? What for? Unless my diagnoses are completely wrong, we're in for an epidemic of typhoid fever. What gives you that idea, Doc? I have four patients who have all the symptoms. Well, quarantine them. Four people out of a town of 4,000 don't strike me as being an epidemic. Four cases of typhoid, gentlemen, are quite enough to start preventive measures so there won't be an epidemic. The merchants of this town have put up $12,000 for the county fair. You suggesting that we throw that money up the flu just because four of your patients might have typhoid? All right. All right. You leave me no other course than to go to the newspaper. I'm going to warn this town whether it costs our merchants $12,000 or not. Newspapers won't print nothing we tell it not to, Doctor. How much is your son worth to you, Joe? That's not a fair question. 
You're willing to risk him for $12,000? Oh, he won't uh, get it, will he? Typhoid fever? He might. He can. Only don't worry, Jode. I'm going to say he doesn't get it. <laughs> I hope all you gentlemen sleep well tonight. are all waiting on the front porch, Dad. I have ten of them. Good. Give them each a pile of handbills. Tell them I want one in every house in town and all along Main Street. Here, let me see one. Warning, typhoid fever. Do not attend the county fair. Boil every drop of water you drink. I am making a house-to-house canvas to assure that everyone is examined. I will give each of you medical advice on purification of water and provide chlorinated tablets for those who have their own water supply. If I do not get to your house, come to me in the evenings. John Abbott, M.D. Oh, Dr. Abbott, I'm so glad you came. The children are all inside, and I've talked to every mother in the block. They brought their youngsters over here to save you time. Fine, fine. Now, let's get to work. Doctor, so we came here to your house. I haven't got any money, Doc, but I'll pay you payday. Uh, good evening, folks. Now, if you line up by one, we'll take care of you in the living room. Dad, the city council is all stirred up about us. They say you've alarmed the whole community and ruined the fair. <laughs> I'm afraid we're in trouble again. Uh, probably. Jean, I'm tired. I never felt it before, but, well, I'm an old man. You heard the charges, Dr. Abbott. There's nothing personal in them. The county fair and the reputation of us all has been put in jeopardy by what we must consider an unwarranted action on your part. Have you any defense to offer? No, 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 no defense. Then I have no cause but to put this matter into the record. You do? Uh, meanwhile, I think I'd better go home. I'm sorry to be late, gentlemen. I've been very busy. We have six cases of typhoid fever in Wellington. I shall assume we shall disregard all action taken in this meeting. Do I hear a motion that a committee be appointed to appear before the Board of Supervisors and insist upon cancellation of the county fair? I make such a motion. All in favor, aye. 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 Forty-two cases in Wellington. Twenty-three cases in Palmdale. Sixty-eight cases in Wellington. Thirty-nine cases in Palmdale. Four cases in Westport. But no new cases reported there since the beginning of the epidemic. Well, that's the report, gentlemen. I, for one, think we owe Dr. Abbott a mighty big debt of gratitude. Daddy, there are some people to see you. People? Well, send them in. I think maybe you'd better come out on the front porch. Mm. The minister's there, and, and, well, there's quite a mob of them. Huh? Oh, well, all right. Good evening, doctor. Good evening, reverend. Oh, good evening, all. Doctor, you've, you've been among us for a long time, and you've worked hard. You never made much money, I guess, because the people you worked for didn't have much but you didn't care. You just kept right on working. Maybe a lot of us have been ungrateful. Maybe you think we've forgotten. We haven't. I have here a letter. It's a, a letter of thanks for all you've done. It's got 4,000 signatures, Doctor. Almost every man, woman, and child in this town. It's just to let you know that we, we love you. Dr. Abbott... Yes, Dr. Robinson. In my mind, and in the minds of my colleagues of the County Medical Association, you perform the most outstanding service in the history of our community. You have taught us all something, not only about medicine, but about humanity. The Westport County Medical Association has de delegated me to inform you that if you will honor us with your presence, you have in advance been elected president by acclamation. Oh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, 
Hello, Dad. I'm mighty proud of you. Dick? Well, when did you get back, son? Got in on the afternoon train. I wanted to surprise you. I was just in time to hear the speeches. <laughs> it's so good to see you. <laughs> well, I'm certainly having an exciting day. That, uh, that shingle out there is too small, you know. You'll have to get a bigger one. Bigger one? That's right. There's another name going under yours. Dr. John Abbott and Dr. Richard Abbott. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we'll have a sign painted the first thing in the morning. <laughs> I've waited a long time for that. shame he had to die just when he was getting little recognition. His heart was worn out and so was he. He gave until he didn't have an ounce of strength left to give. What's in the envelope on the bottom? The money for his debts. According to his calculations, he owed the three of you $2,426.37. Do you think he did? Why, uh, why don't we give the money to the charity ward uh, at the hospital? Give it? I kind of agree with you, George. Those debts should have been written off a long time ago. I guess you're right. He was a fine man. We might not have always seen eye to eye. Leastways, not until he swaps around to his way of thinking by one means or another. But he was a fine man. I agree with you. Dr. Abbott was a man to remember. will bring back our star, Lionel Barrymore. But first, a word about doctors from our sponsor. Shenley Laboratories, maker of penicillin Shenley, would like to remind you that the American standard of health is higher than that of any country in the world. We feel sure you'll agree that the man who has done most to make the situation true is the American doctor. Shenley Laboratories pledges to do all within its power to aid America's physicians in their work of maintaining America's high standards of health. And now, the star of tonight's play, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Ladies and gentlemen, to sum up the spirit of this Shenley Laboratory program, this simple and beautiful prayer of the physician, written centuries ago by Maimonides, seems to me to be apt and fitting. The eternal providence has appointed me to watch over the life and death of all thy creatures. May I always see in the patient a fellow creature in pain. Grant me strength and opportunity always to extend the domain of my craft. Now, this is the prayer of the physician. It's ages old, yet today it's as new as the hope for a peaceful way of life for all the world. May we invite you to listen again next week at this same time when Shenley Laboratories presents The Prisoner of Shark Island, starring Zachary Scott. A great star in a great story. Good night. A Man to Remember was produced and directed by Bill Lawrence and was presented through the courtesy of R.K. Radio Pictures, producers of Till the End of Time, starring Dorothy McGuire and Guy Madison. It was a Gene Holloway adaptation. This is Fruit Graham speaking for Shenley Laboratories. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.